By the time Laren found his two and a half year old son, he had been lying face down in a small pond for a long time. The boy had no breath and no pulse. What could God possibly do in this terrible situation? Well, you'll find out next on this episode of Stories of Faith. Hello and welcome to Stories of Faith. Today on the program, I have the pleasure of speaking with a friend of mine who went through a very traumatic event, the drowning of his small son, Jackson. Welcome, Laren Cole. Why, thank you, Doug. It's good to be here. And yes, it was a very traumatic event, I guess. Yeah. Probably the most traumatic event I've ever experienced. Well, I invited you here today, Laren, because I heard your story. I was amazed by it, and I know our audience will be too. But before we get into it, would you mind reading our text of the day? Sure. Yeah. Text is John 11 in verse 25 and 26, Jesus speaking. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Mm. That's a very encouraging verse, yeah, one that is. gives us hope for the future. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the promise is that Jesus says that the Christian who believes in him doesn't really die when they go to sleep. It's a sleep. Jesus calls it a sleep, and that's what's, uh, that's what's so encouraging about it. Well, Aaron, your story is, is a little involved, but it's worth the whole preparation for it. And it begins sometime after your family moved to the country. Mm -hmm. And as I was going over your testimony, that is a story unto itself. Can you briefly tell us why you first of all moved to the yeah, country and then get into the story? Okay, yeah, we're living in a tract housing development down in Southern California. And I've had my first two children. We've had our first two kids. And for some, I just felt impressed that I needed to be a better parent. So I went to the local bookstore and I found a book called Country Living. It was in the, ch the ch parenting section or somewhere like that. And so I opened up that book and read it in the bookstore. And I read over and over that it seemed to me that God was wanting his people with families to move to the country. And I just felt impressed. I bought the book, took it home, shared it with my wife. Well, what's the problem with the cities? Well, the city that says that uh, the, what we were reading about the cities was that it was a place that children can be in trouble, can get in trouble. There's more sin opportunities and those kind of things. And bad influences. Yeah, bad influences yeah. in the city and um, children get in trouble and just a, a number of things there. I thought, well, you know, the Lord has impressed us. We need to move to the country. And so that's when my wife and I both were praying about it. And we said, let's do it. Let's move to the country. And we made a commitment to, to do it. Mm. And that's when the Lord... And not until we made the commitment is when the Lord decided to, to uh, open doors for us. Well, for, can you give me a quick example? Well, yeah, we were looking at uh, the local country. What we thought, this is Southern California. Yeah. If, there's, if there's houses, has an acre, we thought, well, there's, that's got to be the country. But <laughs> he wasn't thinking that at all. And so God would shut every single door on that opportunity. So we'd, we'd call the realtor, sorry, it just sold. And uh, over and over, that happened over and over. And finally, we just prayed, God, where do you want us to move? Well, that's when we got a call from somebody in Northern California that offered us a free home in the country. I mean, really uh, in the country. Are you talking a free home or rent-free home? Well, it's rent-free. Well, they didn't give us the title deed or anything, but they did give us rent-free, and that lasted for over a year. Wow. And so and we just said, that's got to be a sign from God. So, well, that was one of the signs from God. The other sign was we got job opportunities. Uh, I was a dental, um, uh, my wife was a dental hygienist and I was a physical therapist and we wanted work. Four days for me, one day for her. That's what we were looking for. It was such a rural area up in Northern California that um, we didn't think, it was a long shot. I called the local hospital and I told them, I'm looking for work. My, I, I know it's a long shot, but I want physical therapy four days a week. You got anything? But oh, also, also my wife is a dental hygienist. She wants to work one day a week. Do you have something that would work? And the, and the man on the phone said, that's exactly what we're looking for. Physical therapy, four days, dental hygiene, one day. So the free home, tailor-made jobs, we knew that's the calling from the Lord. Wow. And so we decided to make that big step. And, and, and so you moved from Southern California to Northern California? Northern California, but it's not like California. This is the most rural area, I think, if, 
of all the United States, really. It's just so remote. One person per square mile is the population, basically, in Modoc County. Well, let me let me ask you the this this will help clarify how far uh, you know how remote it is. Yeah. Uh, how far away was your nearest Walmart? Okay, that's a good way to do it. Uh, 120 miles to the nearest one, <laughs> <laughs> and we just moved from the city where there was three of them within 10 minutes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, no Walmart, and no Taco Bell. Yeah. Nothing. I mean, we're in the this is cattle country, and it's just uh, remote. There's people there, but they don't live like the city folks do. When you arrived, uh, how many children? How many children do you have now, and how many I've children? I've got five, all adults now, 25 through 18, and down to 18, and so yeah. And we had two when we finally moved. Okay, the first two came along. First okay. two came along, Alex and Madison. Okay. And then, then as soon as we got up to uh, the the free home in Modoc County, California, that's when we had our third one, Jackson. Uh, he would be the su subject of our discussion here. Okay. And then we had two more. Just kept on going, you know, threw in a couple extra for good measure. Well, do you like big families? Had you planned on having no, a big family? They were, I hate to say it, and not to sound bad, but uh, it's, they were all accidents, yeah. you know, but they were God's on purposes. Yeah, but uh, well, how have you found uh, having a large family? I mean, that's a whole other dynamic. Oh, it's, it's, it's busy and uh, expensive and <laughs> <laughs> all, that, all the above, yeah. but it does cause you to put more trust and faith in God. And oh, uh, yeah, you know, as bet. a Christian man, you know, we, we have to depend on God a lot more yeah. because of the expenses, financially for, uh, for one reason, but uh, spiritually for the other reason. And, and God provides, and so that's kind of nice. That's a fun way to live. So what happened? What, now we're leading up to the problem. Yeah. Okay, well, the problem is, well, we were, um, we sort of, uh, that free home became un unfree uh, all of a sudden and unavailable. So when we started looking around, we were going to, we found a house down the road that we could move to, and they, would, they, they, they wouldn't sell it to us, but they would rent it to us. And so we rented it. The only problem with it is it had a pond, mm. and our kids didn't know how to swim. Mm. So we decided, well, we'll pray about it, and we'll move there, but we will kind of see if we can hide the pond from them. It's a pond, but it wasn't really visible from the house. It was 37 acres. There's a pond out there. And, mm. uh, and so we decided to maybe try to just... And, and that just worked. Never bring it up. Never yeah. bring it up. We won't go walk. We won't let them see it. And for some reason, that worked pretty well mm -hmm. for, for a long time. The kids would play outside, and not one of them ever mentioned a pond. <laughs> we couldn't believe it. <laughs> My wife and I would say, this is working out pretty good. They don't see the pond. So what age groups were they at this time? I see. Alex was probably five, and Madison was probably four, and Jackson was just, you know, one. No, he was two. He was two, mm -hmm. going on three. And then uh, Kennedy was newborn. You know, she she was oh, just wow. bare, just in the bassinet. So, and we haven't had Carter the, fourth, the fifth yet. Do you think that the Lord kind of put His hand over their eyes so that they would never find this pond? It seems like it. I really think that. You know, it's hard to believe that that could happen, yeah. but uh, it it seems like it because because uh, we finally found a house to move to to buy and call our own. You know, our first real estate investment and. Um, so we decided, well, we're going to move. We'll show the kids the pond. And so we took them down to it. It took a while to remove the veil. It seemed like it was on their face, on their eyes. And it took a while to actually notice there's a pond there, kids. And when they did, it seemed like their, their countenances changed. A pond? They, they just couldn't, you know, they, they hadn't seen it. And there, there it was. And so we said, well, you better be careful. We don't know how to swim, so you don't want to get in that pond. Well, kids love water, yeah. so you're, when you say that they, they found yeah. it and they had their eyes open, it was like, wow, there's a pond, right? Yeah, and that obviously was a big mistake to tell them about that. We probably should have been, uh, we should have gave them swimming lessons. That would have been the practical thing to do, but yeah. uh, it's cold up there. You know, the ice is, there's ice and yeah. snow, and then the summer's nice, but, mm. man. Okay, so now that they know about it, uh, but you're about to move out of there, so you... Yeah, we figure it's okay. Yeah. You know, we'll get them to see it. We're going to be moving. But the house we were buying needed remodeling. Uh -huh. And so it took a little while. It took about three or four months before we could get in there because it, it needed to be kind of made livable. Yeah. And so um, what happened next? It was April 22, I think it was, and it was Mickey's day to work. And Mickey, uh, she got up and uh, was ready for work. And I was going to stay home, do my job, take care of the four kids. And so it all, all went pretty well. You know, Mickey got up, off to work, and um, I'm taking care of the kids. Uh, uh, we had breakfast, we had lunch, and then I sent the, the big kids out to, to play. Mm -hmm. And Jackson went with them. They went all out to play. And um, I stayed inside, did some, some work on the computer um, uh, with the baby, Kennedy, and, mm -hmm. and her little 
car carrier. We kept her in the car carrier. So we're doing work, and, uh, and I lost track of time. Mm. And time started getting away, and I realized it's getting late, 4 o'clock or whatever it was, and I got to go check on those kids, you know. This is... And so I got out there, and as soon as I went outside, you know, uh, I could see there was a few problems. Uh, Alex had just hurt himself. He came up to me with blood coming out of his head, and he had ridden his little motorcycle into a satellite dish. That was your oldest? Oldest, yeah. Okay. So he had a little problem, so I'm, I'm attending to it. Like, okay, let's get the wound care ma material, and that's kind of what I did in physical therapy. I wound, did a lot of wound care, so I had all this stuff, and I'm going to do some doctoring on Alex's head. <laughs> I'm patching him up, stuffing all the, the, the brains back into his Ooh, head. And well, I, I hope you're exaggerating. <laughs> yeah, very much exaggerating, because it wasn't that bad of a, it was just blood in it. Uh, yeah. And he wasn't wearing his helmet, I, and, and Mama would not have been happy with me. I was failing my duties there, but anyway. And Madison, as I'm dressing the wound, I see Madison come from my peripheral vision. She comes up, mm -hmm. and I hadn't noticed Jackson yet, so, but I hadn't noticed Madison. But finally Madison comes up, and she asks, she says, excuse me, Dad. Mm -hmm. And I said, just a minute. Yeah, I'm busy, you know. And I had to go and get more wound supplies, came back out. And she waited her turn, because my daddy asked her to wait. So she was a good little girl. She was waiting, and mm -hmm. waiting, and waiting. Well, I finally got the thing done, and I, I remember, oh, Madison, you wanted to say something. You know, what was it that you wanted to say? And she said, um, she thought about it, almost had forgot. She goes, oh, Jackson drowned. Now, how old is she? She's four. Probably about four. Ish. Now, I might be uh, wrong on that age, but I, I think she's four. Something four and a half. I, I, something in that range. So, right? In that range, yeah. And so, uh, and she hadn't, she doesn't, she's kind of quiet. She's a, the, the loudest one of our children now, but she, at this time, she was very, <laughs> very quiet. Mm -hmm. And a, a, a little girl of very few words. So, Jackson drowned. I said, Madison, that's something you should have brought up. That's something you could have told me a little while ago. Jackson drowned, huh? And she goes, yeah, Jackson drowned. And I go, well, where, what do you mean he drowned? Where is he? And she, then she sort of realized I'm frantic, so she clammed up and wouldn't talk anymore. And oh, she, she got scared. She got scared, yeah. And she wouldn't tell me. And uh, I said, well, maybe you mean, did he see in the creek? We had a creek that fed into the pond. I thought, well, maybe he's down in the creek and he got stuck in the mud. Is that what you mean? And she wouldn't tell me. So she wouldn't, she wouldn't help me out any more than that. So I'm, and I'm, I'm getting pretty frantic, you know, about this. Uh, so, so I go, okay, good. He's probably just, dra he's just uh, stuck in the mud. So I grabbed Kennedy and I ran down, down the hill over to where the creek was, what we call gravity cavity. I went down there. Mm -hmm. I went down to the bottom and, oh, he's not there. Mm -hmm. No, and the Madison's following from a distance. Alex is coming too, though. He's, he's following too from a distance. And, and I'm yelling back at Mount Madison, where is he? And Daddy's, I never yell at her, so she's not used to yelling. Yelling scared her. She doesn't, she's never heard that before, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank God, I mean, mm -hmm. I shouldn't yell ever, but uh, I needed to, 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 to get the point across. I mean, where is he, you know? And, and then I realized I'm gonna have to go look in the pond. And um, so I picked up Kennedy out of her car seat. I'm carrying her now, and I, and I start going down the creek, down, down, down through the bulrushes. And, and there I come across the pond, and I see in view of the pond, and the first thing I see is ja a toy that Jackson played with. And then I know this is not going to be good, you know, oh, he's no. probably in there. Oh, and no. I get closer and closer, and there he was. I, I kind of see him. His body was out in the middle of the pond. He was face down, his head underwater, completely limp, just still as ever. It's just he had been there a long time, you could tell. So when you came across him, you just saw him floating face down? Face down. Just and there. Floating with his arms yeah. up like face down, arms up, red sweatshirt on. And who knew how long he had been that way? We did some investigation on that, and a, a pastor came out. In fact, maybe some of the people know Del Griebel, mm -hmm. Pastor Del Griebel. And uh, he came in, walked us through, and did some like investigative journalism. He said it's probably about 30 minutes. Wow. There's more to the story, and we want to get to it. But folks, we have to take a break. So stay with us, and you're going to get to hear the exciting end of the story of what happened to little... Jackson. Jackson, two and a half years old. Yep. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Better Life Broadcasting is a viewer-supported Christian media ministry that offers streaming programming via apps on various devices. Please visit blbn.org to support Better Life or to get more information. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Hello and welcome back to Stories of Faith. 
We've been listening to the exciting story that Laren Cole has been sharing with us about what happened to his son one day when he found him drowned in a small pond. But before we continue the story, Laren, would you please tell us a little bit about the ministry you're involved with? Sure, uh, it's Desire Media, and I'm the director, speaker, whatever, um, of that ministry. And the Desire Media is all about Bible study, personal Bible study, Revelation seminars. And we haven't been doing a lot of Revelation seminars since COVID, and a lot of cancellations there. But uh, so since then, we've been doing weekend seminars. Mm -hmm. And we do weekend seminars. Our seminar is called Animals and People That Rest on Saturday. It's mm -hmm. all about what's so special about Adventists, about uh, Saturday and, and the Sabbath and prophecy. If somebody wanted to see what you offer or maybe contact you, what's your website? It's desiremedia.org. And we've got, yeah, just go right to the contact page. And there's an 800 number on there. And you can look us up. And that's how you contact Desire Media. And then what about if they want to email you? Can they email you directly? Yep, Laren, L-A-R-R-E-N, at desiremedia.org. Very good, yeah, very, very good. easy. <laughs> so you do seminars, you talk about Bible topics. Yep. Very good, very yes. good. Well, when we left off, Laren, uh, you had told us the story of how your family moved to the country and you had little ones and you moved to a piece of property where there was a pond that somehow the Lord kept them from seeing all the time they lived there, except at the very end, you introduced them to this pond and that ended up being a kind of a, a yeah. mistake. Big mistake, yeah. Yeah, and we left the story when you had found your son lying face down in the pond, uh, and we were estimating it might have been 30 minutes? That's, yeah, I, I, that's based on where he was positioned, the pond, and everything. I, I mean, that was Del Grebel, and he had uh, helped sort of piece that together. What did you do when you came upon this, your worst nightmare? Yeah, you know, I was in a full run. I was running with Kennedy, my little baby, in our, my arms, and uh, what I did, I didn't even stop running. I, I, the first thing I did when I saw him, I realized, you know, I got to get to him. I got to get him out of there. I wanted him out. I couldn't believe my son with his face under the water, and he's still. He's obviously, this isn't, this is the worst thing. I mean, this is the most dramatic thing that's ever happened wow. to me. So I slowed down just enough to drop Kennedy in the, in the reeds that were there on the side of the pond. Uh -huh. And I just plunged right in, fully dressed, mistake there, because uh, I couldn't swim very well, because I had these boot-like shoes on. Oh, prevented me from treading water. So I'm, but I'm trying and trying and trying, and I should have just kicked them off. But, but uh, luckily for me, he's floating. Uh -huh. Later, Pastor Dell said that you know he was in the uh, what is he in the Navy? No, no, no. He was a chaplain in the Navy, I think, or whatever. But he he sees he knows about death, and so he says this body should not have been floating. First of all, mm -hmm. you know, it should have been sunk to the bottom of uh -huh. a 12-foot pond there. Wow. Anyway, but he was up in the air, and I'm trying to tread water, and it took me it what seemed like three, four, or five minutes just to get out there and get a hold of him. And as soon as I got to the body, I mean, I grabbed him. I wanted his face out of the water. I wanted that guy to, to be able to breathe. I tried to pull his head out of the water, and that made me sink. I couldn't tread water by myself already, but holding him up, I went under, and I'm just holding him, and then I realized I can't get up, so I, I had to put him back under the water, which is really difficult. I had to put him under the water just to get myself from drowning. And uh, so then I'm... I'm Really, I'm not going to be able to get him out. I'm going to have to just drag his lifeless body under the water out of the pond. So here I am treading the water again, trying to get out of the pond. And I was exhausted by the time I got to the shore. Wow. Yeah, I'm tired, and I finally got to the shore, trying to catch my breath, dragged him out of the water, laid him on the little reeds close to where Kennedy was. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, I, and I just lay there trying to catch my breath. And then I, I assessed him really quickly, too, as soon as I caught my breath. And there was no pulse, like he said. There was no breath, you know. I had just taken CPR, and I, you know, there's. I didn't even think to do CPR because it's. He's cold, yeah. and there's no breath. So, I'm laying there thinking, what do I do? You know, and things racing through my mind, and I'm watching this. My dead son. I'm supposed to be taking care of him, and I'm doing a terrible job. Mickey's about to come home. What am I going to say to her, my wife? Yeah. You know, um, going through all this, and so I decided. I remember reading a book about some lady that her son drowned. She rolled him. And, that, and he revived. So I started rolling around trying to get water out. Nothing, that didn't, nothing happened. Mm. And finally, I just belted out a prayer. You know, I just yelled to God, I, God, you tell me what to do. I, do. You do something. You know, he's dead. And Alex, by this time, had come up. And I'm, I'm going, Alex, your brother's dead. What do we do? Mm. I didn't know what to do. And just about that time, when I yelled out, a little voice spoke into me. I've never heard this like this before, but it was... In your mind. I don't know if it's audible. I, maybe it was audible, I, it, but it was definitely in my mind. It was clear as a bell. Now would be a good time to try CPR. That's what it said. Yeah. Now would be, a, and I just certified, so 
I, so I, I, I just acknowledged that, and I just tilted his head back, cleared his airway, pinched his nose off. Child CPR, one breath, five chest compressions at the time. Mm -hmm. I did that, his chest expanded, and he exhaled, but there was no inhale, so I did five chest compressions. And I did it again, no response. I'm thinking, the little voice is, I'm saying, this is not, this is useless, I'm saying to myself. The voice said, keep going. Did it again, one more round. I breathed into him, he exhaled, and then all of a sudden, praise the Lord, he inhaled all by himself. The mm. whole little body came to life. It gasped for air, and then, and I jumped back because it scared me. You know, I'm not expecting him. This, you thought he was gone. I thought he was gone, but I was so excited. I don't know what the feeling was, but I was just so happy that he, he breathed in. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. I showed Alex. Alex, he's alive. And, and then all of a sudden his body started spasming, you know, like, um, like, like a seizure. Seizures, yeah. He's, he's, he started crunching up. He started breathing, but he was moaning. Mm. And he was having lots of difficulty breathing. And he was moaning. He would, he would inhale, then he would bellow some out, you know, uh, you know, like, like a cow giving birth or something, but it yeah, was terrible. Yeah. It was horrible. I picked him up and said, well, he's alive, Alex, let's go. Can you grab Kennedy and we'll go back to the house, call 911. That's what we did. We, we ran back up to the house. I called 911 and tried to explain what happened. And they dispatched a, a, an ambulance from Lakeview, Oregon to come down 20 miles south to where we were. So being in the middle of nowhere was a detriment. That, at that was a moment. detriment, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But and he's not getting worse. The spasms are getting worse. His eyes actually rolled back in his in their sockets where you couldn't see the the, oh, wow. the, the pupils, yeah. and he's moaning and and the 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 tech on the phone was telling me to take his try to get the clothes off, try to get him warm. Yeah. And I got a I got his pants off. I didn't get the shirt off, but I got his pants off. I'm just confused, you know. I'm yeah. I'm in shock myself. Yeah. I think, and um, I don't know what to do. And then. He told me, well, they, they've dispatched an ambulance, and uh, he tried to stay on the phone with me, and then Mickey comes home. Mickey came home, and I could hear the kids, Alex and uh, Madison, ran out to meet Mama. She's home. She's tired. She comes in the, in the door, and I don't know what to say. To, I mean, what, this, is, this is not good for her. They came out and ran up to Mama and told Mickey, Mama, guess what? Jackson drowned. Yeah, guess what? Guess what? Yeah, and she said, she goes, what? She goes, don't say stuff like that to me. You scared mommy, you know? Yeah. She thought they were just kidding or yeah. whatever. They never said that before. But she came in, and then she hears Jackson moaning and, um, and me on the phone with his pants off and trying to do it. And then, and then she just broke down. She just lost it. I mean, she couldn't believe it. So I just asked her to go in the other room and pray. And so she took the kids in and started praying. The EMT on the phone told me, we had a change in plans. We want you to get in your car and meet the ambulance because this is going to, this is going to, time is of the essence. And so we, we did. I said, okay, let's get in the car. We all jumped in the ex Ford Expedition. We went down, met the ambulance. Uh, we transferred Jackson into the ambulance and they started doing, uh, they tried, they put a, a warming jacket on him and uh, they took his, they cut his uh, sweatshirt off and they started uh, all kinds of things and they started trying to warm him up. I, I'm not sure if they intubated him or tried to get a tube down his throat to get some water out because his chest was sticking out. Mm -hmm. It was really out, like water was in it or something. And um, we, got, we got on the road, 150 miles an hour, and started um, getting up to the hospital. We got to the hospital, transferred him into the ER room. They put him on a tube. They started pumping out gallons of green water, green oh, water out of his lungs. And uh, I'm just standing at his side and just in shock still. I'm just, uh, a, a nurse finally came up to me as this is all going on, and he's not getting any better. And she said, you need to go and change. Uh, you f you're wet, too. I didn't even realize I'm soaking wet, you know, and I'm shivering. It's April. It's cold out where we live in, in April, but not too cold, but it's cold. Why don't you go into the little room, change? Here's a gown you can put it on, and, and, uh, and, and then you can come back. And so I did. I went down to the room, and, I, and as I was getting ready to change, that same little voice mm -hmm. in my mind, it said, ask me again. You know, ask for another. Like, I asked for... And I wasn't expecting an answer, but this time I was expecting an answer. This is the same voice. That voice was right the last time. It said, do CPR, <laughs> and it worked, and, but it didn't work good enough. And then the voice said, you know what, let's do stage two. The voice said, ask me again. I'm sitting here hearing his voice, and I said, well, I got on my knees, and I reverently prayed. I said, God, do a miracle. I don't know what to say, but he's hurt. We just want our son back. Please, do, do a miracle, amen. And I had the confidence and peace I knew God was going to answer. I didn't know how, but I just knew 
that he told me to pray it, it's going to be answered. So I went back in the ER room and I stood by and he's still, he's not better. And I'm wondering, well, what, how is he going to get better? And so I finally, um, I looked at Jackson and I said, Jackson, got close to him. I said, Jackson, are you cold? Mm -hmm. and, he, and, and, and I reached out and I touched him on the chest to fill him. And mm -hmm. as soon as my hand touched his chest, his eyes came back in their sockets. He stopped moaning and he turned his head, looked right at me and said, yes. He said, yes, Whoa. he answered the question. Yes, I'm cold. In the ER room was probably, two, I don't know, I was gonna say 20 nurses, but everybody from Lakeview Hospital was in there and there was a, a more than one doctor in there and, and workers, this place was a crowded ER. And they all started cheering, they, they all started cheering and saying, praise the Lord, because they couldn't believe it. I mean, I just stepped back, I go, whoa, he's well. I mean, this is. That reminds me of when Jesus used to touch people and heal them. Yeah. It was like God gave you the, the the um, ability to be a part of this. When you yeah. touched him, you saw the, the one Lord time, work. huh? <laughs> yeah, you saw the Lord work. It transferred to the to the uh, ICU, and um, anyway. Now he, we're running out of time, but I want back. you to mention well, one thing. How did you feel about Jackson after this event? You told the story. Oh yeah. Oh, after that, I did not let him out of my sight. I mean, yeah. I'm glued to this little guy. Everywhere he went, I was there with him. I didn't want to leave him. After a week, oh, I took a week off of work. Uh -huh. I'm just glued. Everywhere Jackson was, bed shower, tub, wherever. And so why was that? Well, after a week of this, I'm sort of going, the Lord again spoke to me kind of in his little still, still voice and uh -huh. said, you know, look, look, look what you're doing. You love the child because you, you had him. You, you, procreation is a natural thing, but now that you've played a part in redeeming, bringing him back to life, you love him 10 times more, 100 <laughs> times more. And he said, that's how I love you and humanity who I've died to save. Now, somebody asked Jackson after the fact, what did he see when he was yeah. dead? Yeah, you know? we had a lot of that, but the, particularly one nurse called me up and she said, ask Jackson, what did he, what did he see when he's dead? I, cause I, I, you're supposed to go to heaven or hell, right, when you die. And so I asked him and he said, I was playing at the side of the pond and then I fell in and then nothing, <laughs> nothing. I said, I told the nurse, did you hear that? Yeah. He's nothing. She said, yeah, and we had a Bible study. And we looked up all the text on death, and she said, I, I, guess, I guess when you die, you go to sleep and you wait for one of two resurrections. And yeah. I said, that's what the Bible teaches. Well, that's an amazing story, and I'm so happy for your family that you got Thank to see you, that Dad. miracle happen right in front of your face. What a gift to Praise be given. Yeah. I wouldn't want to go through it again, nope, but boy, nope. the Lord is there when you need him, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, friends, we hope you've enjoyed the story and become blessed by it and see that the Lord still works in miraculous ways in our day and age. Remember, I want to leave you with these words. Give your heart to God, do what He says, and you too can have your very own story of faith.